So today we're delighted to have uh, Jeremy Fries as our, our roundback speaker. Uh, Jeremy just moved to Stanford after uh, a long career at Northwestern and Wisconsin, so we welcome him to the Bay Area and are just delighted that he was able to be part of uh, our roundback for his first uh, year here. Um, I first came across Jeremy, I think, when I read this book, Born to Rebel, and I think this big idea book kind of thing, and somebody said, oh, somebody's already done some analysis to see if this even holds up to first order, and it was Jeremy, and immediately found that, uh, so I think of Jeremy as someone with, in front of big ideas with actual data, and an actual empiricism. So today we're going to get a, a, a talk about uh, the use of college scores and thinking about causality. So we're just delighted to have you here. Uh, Jeremy works in the world of quantitative sociology, but also has interacted with demography throughout his career. And so we're really happy to have him uh, joining us here today. Um, thanks so much. Great, thank you, thank you. I am uh, happy to be here. Uh, there is an exciting uh, interdisciplinary conversation going on about, uh, uh, I think it's a particularly promising moment for the, the use of uh, genomic data in, uh, in social science. Uh, one of the interesting developments over the last seven or eight years as a, as a speaking matter has been that I, it would used to be the case that if I would talk about things near that, I would be talking about an audience almost certainly that would uh, usually it was the case that that uh, no one or hardly anyone in the audience would know much about this stuff, or occasionally I would have an audience where everybody knew a lot about this stuff and maybe not about social science, but now it is, there's a lot more variation and, and interest in and, uh, discussions across uh, different things. So it's exciting in that respect, a little bit more challenging for a speaker. Um, the structure of this uh, is going to be uh, a little bit inverted from what one normally sees, perhaps. Normally, you've probably had talks where somebody has a whole set of things and they end up doing a first half and then they have to rush through the second half because of the first half. Uh, I actually want to make sure that I get to my second half. And so if you see me kind of rushing around right at the start, uh, that is what uh, I'm going to. But I want to do, give kind of an idea of, of sort of what I see as being the ultimate big idea that some of this sort of work is moving toward or how to think about it. But then I want to talk about what we're doing and, and uh, sort of ramping up to do with polygenic scores, okay? You'll be able to tell the slides because there's different pieces that can fit together in a more intricate talk, and I want to get to number four uh, and uh, on it, but I want to get some just animating examples to think about sort of how the bigger picture of what genetics uh, could ultimately contribute to, to so, uh, how to think about it right work. And I, I want to start with an example. I like this, incidentally, this picture because uh, well, you think you know which way the train is going, but look a little longer. It's an interesting experience. Uh, if you can't see it, then maybe somebody can explain it to you later, but it's just because of the, I want to pose with about ideas about directionality. But I want to talk first just briefly about uh, depression. This is borrowing on some work by some uh, Dutch scholars. This is an animating example for thinking of things, because if we think about depression, a number of uh, symptoms uh, go into depression. Somebody presents with depression or gets a diagnosis has a collection uh, of, of symptoms, and if you have so many, and that invites a certain way of thinking about uh, uh, what depression is, and it invites a way of thinking about what depression is, where you have a little, is it a dark cloud, or is it kind of a brain-like thing, but it, ultimately the depression is some inside latent construct, right, that is manifesting itself in these different symptoms. If you've taken a latent variable model, you know, you have an underlying latent variable, and, and it shows itself in these different symptoms. Um, but once we start to, if you actually look at the symptoms of depression and give it some thought, right, you realize a lot of these symptoms of depression actually certainly stand in causal relationships with one another. Right? And so you have fatigue and psychomotor states, or, or sleep and mood, or appetite and weight change. Clearly these things have a causal uh, relationship with one another. And, and when you have that, when you have a group of, of things that have a causal relationship with one another, obviously that in and of itself, you don't need, and certainly don't need as the only and ultimate driving thing, some latent underlying lower level of analysis thing that is causing that to emerge. But those things themselves, even if there was simply the case where you had only those causal relationships, that would cause those things to become intercorrelated over time, and you could pull out a general factor. We could call this D or something like that. We can talk about it. And this is the sort of idea that I'm not going to get much to talk about, but that I think is important, the idea of, of thinking about those things as 
uh, borrowing from biology the idea of a mutualism, but that you have a set of things that reinforce one another, and as such, pull out a lot of the properties that we would associate with uh, a latent uh, construct. Right? Uh, and uh, depression, particularly, we've seen to be genetically elusive, but I'm not going to talk to that because I want to get to number four. Right? I'm also, I mean, this one is going to go real fast, but I just want to get us thinking. To talk about test scores, I can talk about this to no end of time. Claude has uh, also thought about this a lot, is, is here. But if you think about cognitive test scores, the, the single biggest uh, finding of all in psychometrics is the idea of what's called a positive manifold, which is that any pair of test scores you'll find is going to be correlated with one of them. Right? And that, goes by a variety of names, it's sometimes called general cognitive ability, right? If that'll let her, we could, we could call this G, right, underlying this, in fact, that's what it's called, as, as uh, some of you uh, well know this idea of an underlying kind of factor. But uh, again, if we think back of these skills, we recognize again that a lot of cognitive skills, or things that we take of skills in any domain, are correlated with one another, right? Reading skills, for example, uh, allow general knowledge to emerge, right, uh, and other things. And, and one can see this possibility, and we don't want to necessarily push this uh, uh, too far, but, but uh, an exciting idea in the study of cognition in the last 10 or so years is the idea that, that cognition may also exhibit properties of a mutualism. That is to say that we, we want to think about it as this underlying brain thing that shows up in all of these other tests, Right? But part of that can also be the fact that the different dimensions of skill or different even underlying physical have a causal relationship with each other over time that makes this latent factor emerge as easy to imagine is going to be something that if we could only get to this lower biological level of analysis, maybe we'll be able to identify exactly what it is. Um, and then it proves elusive once we get more specific biological measures. Um, now there's some interesting, I'm going to skip this because I think pretty good idea for already being uh, on that. There's some interesting features of cognitive ability that uh, I'm not going to get to talk about at length, but I'll mention their curiosities about the genetic study of cognitive ability. One is that uh, estimates of genetic influence on cognitive test scores tend to increase uh, with age over the early life course over until about age 20 uh, or so. That's often uh, interpreted as meaning somehow the genes are coming out, but I'm going to invite a different way uh, of thinking about that. There's a steady population increase in cognitive test scores, this thing called the Flynn effect, um, to such an extent that if, if, uh, if taken seriously, one might think that, that uh, one's grandparents would be uh, on track for, for needing special help in schools, uh, even if they're of average uh, intellect at the time. Right? There's also this curious thing uh, where we might think uh, that, uh, that the genetic influences are going to be stronger for tests that are less cultural right, in nature. If we, if we have this, this false dichotomy about, about genes and the way environments work, and, and when we get to culture, we kind of get outside of, of or at least less uh, genetic influence. But in fact, the opposite is true. So the harder it is to translate, a part of an IQ. So vocabulary would be the prototypic example. Vocabulary is tests are very hard to translate across cultures because you can't just it's not even just translate the words because of difficulties or whatever. Um, those tests are actually compare that to something like manipulate the blocks and make this picture of the blocks. Right? The tests that are more culturally uh, specific in that sense actually have higher heritability, it's, it's suggesting that there's this acquisition over time of cultural knowledge as part of what. Uh, of what things like IQ, despite our desire to think of this as just some brain property, uh, are. And there's also uh, uh, some evidence that in some contexts, I don't think people think about this quite right, um, but a stimulating idea is that the heritability of cognitive test scores will increase as SES increases. So in other words, uh, thinking about uh, uh, cognition, uh, thinking about uh, positive environments as drawing out uh, uh, differences between people um, other than, rather than compensating or being in some battle with them. You put all these together and you kind of get uh, an underlying idea. And we can call this idea the idea of, of pervasive alignment, where we might imagine that embodied uh, characteristics, cognition uh, is, I mean, we, when we measure cognitive test scores, we separate people from all aspects of the environment. You can't use Google on a cognitive test, right? This is uh, an embodied 
characteristic. It's part of the body, even though people want to be dualist about thinking about what cognitive stuff is compared to other physical things, right? In social environments, they pervasively reinforce one another, right? In other words, over the life course, what we can see happening is we can see social advantage and embodied advantages uh, converging together and coming into alignment over the life course, clarifying differences between people, right? And, and, and that can appear to be so, so one thing that you'll see in literature on, uh, will be the, that enormous midlife stability in something like cognition or something like personality will be taken as, well, that's evidence that it's really, that's, that's, that shows that it's biological, because otherwise, why isn't it, why isn't it moving around uh, in, in midlife? But then you think about the extent to which people also are selecting into environments over time, and you think, well, why, why would it? What is the kind of disruption we're imagining exists in people's environment that would disrupt rank order stability? Right? So all kinds of different ways uh, in which we can invert our thinking about this, and the ways that, that genetic information is traditionally thought to be scary, um, where really it, it shows profound interdependence between genes and uh, environments. Right? Um, this is going to be brief, um, uh, but I just want to highlight this idea of fundamental causes of health. I've contributed to this literature. I won't trumpet myself with that. Did I skip the slide on Florida? I did, but let's skip that. Um, where uh, the fundamental causality perspective on health has been a very influential idea in, in uh, the epidemiological minded uh, sociology. It, it looks at things like, this is a classic, uh, this is a graph of diabetes. This gray line here is survival rates for diabetes uh, after, uh, well, this is survival rates for diabetes after uh, insulin, and the black line is before insulin for type 1 diabetes. So in other words, with type 1 diabetes before insulin. Yeah, the other way. You know what I mean. I mean, with type 1 diabetes before insulin, no health disparity in it because everybody died, right? People would waste away and uh, die uh, within a 10-year period, right? Uh, after insulin, we have this remarkable improvement in, in oh yeah, they're dying. They're not, sorry, I don't know what I was thinking there, I'm sorry. Um, but you know uh, what I'm thinking, right? Um, after insulin, we have the survival rate. And what you can't see in this graph is at the same time, at the same time that we have improved in this, technological advances for diabetes, we have created disparity in diabetes. So now, uh, in addition to all the things we could talk about with type 2 diabetes, people with type 1 diabetes, lower socioeconomic standard people, are, are more likely to have all the negative consequences we associate with high elevated glucose levels over the life, or go blind, or lose their feet, or whatever. Um, uh, uh, so we've created a disparity by having an advance, by knowing what to do about a disease. And this is the heart of of the idea of a fundamental cause perspective on health disorders. I won't talk about that. I've been involved with some ethnographic work a long time ago on this, but I want to know what the idea is, which is to reflect upon this idea that what you see in SES and health is you see that SES and health relationships, the causes of health change over time. They change over places. What's killing people in one part of the world is different from what kills people in the United States. Uh, for that matter, uh, we've seen in our own uh, lifetimes changes in the, the relative death rates from heart uh, disease uh, and cancer. And uh, for that matter, we've gone through transition of infections. You, know, you know all this about, about these transitions. The causes of health change, and yet uh, we see at the SES relationship repeating itself over and over again uh, over time. And on both sides of the equation, we think about there being really people who know and think about it. They might simplify the other side, but if you work on one side, you recognize that there's a, a system uh, at work. Um, in socioeconomic status, we recognize that education causes uh, income and it stands in a relationship with occupation. We do put these in classically in latent factor models, but we kind of believe uh, if you were actually to articulate what's going on. In fact, people study exactly these things as uh, research questions. So you have this thing that you have different factors of people's lives coming together, right? And meanwhile, in, in, uh, uh, as an abiding thing, especially with the rise of biomarkers in social science, there's been, oh, uh, well, let's look at these biomarkers and let's show uh, that they're related over time. 
um, that they pull together uh, over the life course in ways that, that uh, is not unlike SES, only on the bodily side. Um, and uh, even efforts to let well, us give that a name, we could, we could refer to that as something like biological age, right? Where we see all of these different aspects of the body. Obviously, we see, right, especially in old age, one part of the body uh, uh, starts to fail, and that puts a burden on other parts of the body. So these things exist in causal relationships uh, with each other. In other words, we have these transactions between social disadvantage and uh, embodied uh, disadvantage, and we see these over time, right? coming into uh, alignments rather than these simple kind of models of one causing uh, the other. Right? I've done some work related to cognition in, in, uh, with administrative data with some economists in Florida um, connected to pervasive alignments, you like the postcard. Um, but I'm, I, we have not actually found the kind of evidence for it that we were expecting and we're trying to figure out how to puzzle through that. Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about uh, polygenic scores. <laughs> Look at that. that was not a bad we were start. Good. We didn't ask questions. This is when, yeah, you saw. Well, I, that's, I thought I'd give a heads up and get to this. Okay. So, with educational attainment, uh, this is some work uh, that a uh, graduate student of mine, Amelia Brannigan, uh, and I did a few years ago. We collected all of the twin correlations for uh, educational attainment uh, that existed and uh, calculated uh, the, using the, the classical. Uh, formula for calculating the heritability of educational attainment showed that across uh, samples the average heritability of educational attainment was about 40 percent. There's a different part of this, there's a twist uh, that is um, about the heritability of, or about behavior genetics models of educational attainment. It's weird. Um, uh, basically you can see the, the uh, shared environment in educational attainment much more strongly than you can with traits that behavioral <coughs> genetics that normally study. Uh, but here, um, this, this uh, heritability of, of a 40% uh, estimate for uh, educational attainment prompts interest in exactly uh, what is going on uh, with that, right? What is, what is this heritability? For a long time, uh, behavior genetics just kind of existed in this shock and awe phase of showing twin coral at large, and, and after that, there wasn't much you could do uh, without making some extremely complicated modeling assumptions. Uh, but then there became the rise of molecular genetic data and its interest in uh, social uh, uh, science. Um, but that itself uh, led to this thing that is now referred to in ominous tones as the candidate gene era. I've given uh, at least one talk uh, at uh, Berkeley uh, uh, decrying this era uh, a while ago. Um, but we can even see this with this example from educational attainment. This is from an article that was published at AJS. This is a particular genetic variant, uh, TAC1A, it's near a dopamine receptor uh, gene. Uh, so there's three possible, somebody can be homozygous uh, for C or homozygous for T on, uh, on TAC1A. It's a SNP, it's a single nucleotide polymer. Can I just step away from the camera? Sure. Okay. Do you see now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and this would be the heterozygous. But what you can see here, this is uh, from Ad Health, so I've got it colored in Carolina blue. Um, <laughs> that you can see that in Ad Health, there's uh, uh, there's this effect that is like a, tw a 20 percentage point effect of this one genetic variant. That's almost the same size as the entire black-white difference in educational attainment, for example. Would it be plausible that this would really be, if we think about it, one genetic variant have that big uh, of an effect? Uh, and what happens throughout the Canada gene uh, era and why people talk about it having 99% uh, or more uh, false positive uh, rate would be, uh, as we did in the Wisconsin data that I'll talk about, uh, you try to replicate this, you replicate, try to replicate it with a, a large example, and you don't see any findings uh, don't uh, replicate. Right? And even the large uh, genome-wide studies that I'll talk about have not found anything at this location. Uh, and there's, there's problems with the candidate gene approach. I think the big problem are just all the sorts of things that lead to false positives elsewhere, especially just the large number of research and degrees of freedom. Uh, there's also this thing uh, known as the chopsticks problem in, uh, in um, uh, genetics, uh, the problem of population uh, stratification, uh, which is that you can, uh, if you're not careful with what you're doing, it's easy to mistake uh, ancestral differences in any social consequences of those ancestral differences for genetic differences. The easy way to think about it would be to imagine that if you naively took uh, data 
uh, you could imagine that there was a chopsticks gene because you could see uh, genetic variants associated with being Asian also being associated with chopsticks use. Right? Um, and so if, that, if you can understand that problem, you can see where population, you'd have to figure out ways uh, to take that uh, into account. Right? So, so that, this area I sort of talked about in the, sort of the, the dark hush tones that, that, that gather people around a campfire on Halloween uh, at this time. Um, and what has instead uh, become a source of much enthusiasm is the idea that, uh, that because what we think of with, with these complex effects is that they're very small and diffuse across the genome, what we need are going to be very large samples, so large that you're not going to have one individual study, but that you're going to have to put together a whole lot of studies, right, uh, to get a whole lot of people. And if you do that, you might be able to get evidence, uh, replicable evidence of signal uh, in uh, the genome. Educational attainment turns out to be particularly propitious for this because it's, it's such an important outcome to be so easily measured with good accuracy from a single question that all kinds of medical cohorts include it the way that they would include a basic demographic uh, characteristic. Okay. Uh, and so this is brought, this paper came out uh, I think officially came out uh, in the last year, um, where uh, they have actually ad identified 74 loci that are associated with educational attainment. This is uh, different single nucleotide polymorphisms that reach the significance threshold of P to the 10 to the negative 8. You have this very high uh, threshold because you're doing a whole lot of tests. So that's essentially a bomb for any correction for a million. Uh, test, <laughs> how to think about it. And the result you get here is what's called a Manhattan plot. It's called a Manhattan plot because it kind of looks like skyscrapers, right? Uh, but in the, in the early days of this, of GWAS, you wouldn't have anything above this line, even for outcomes that are more, or that are, make less people less squeamish. Schizophrenia, for example, took a long time, but you'd see, like, is it going to get over the line? Is something going to get over the line? But now, you can see a sample size gets larger. This is this is nearly 300,000 people on educational attainment. Uh, they, they are believing that with the new UK Biobank data, they're going to get to 1 million uh, people uh, for educational attainment. Um, that you have uh, all of these different uh, hits. And you can see that they're spread across the genome, and, and no one effect is going to be a large effect. Certainly not anything that explains some large percent uh, of, of a difference. But it's going to be an aggregation of small effects Small effects, and then part of the puzzle is figuring out what they need, spread over the gene. Okay? But this plot shows nothing about size, just... Well, I mean, in effect, the, in a, but not, I mean, in the same way that, in the same way that you can, you can get an idea if things are on the same metric of effect size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, so in that, in that sense. But yeah, it's not an effect size. Are you going to talk to me a lot more about this? I think my question is, uh, when we do GWAS, we get some kind of um, significance test on whether there is a polygenic effect. Do we know that these peaks are the right peaks? I mean, a peak that is really big, is that now something we really believe to be not noise? Or is our test for overall noise? And so it could be that we got... Mm -hmm. do, 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 are these yeah. clearly identified sites, or is it, is it, do we just have the general polygenic effect that's clearly No, they're clearly, they're clearly identified. They're not necessarily identifying. We wouldn't necessarily say that this SNP is the causal SNP. Um, that is to say that we're not necessarily saying uh, that a counterfactual difference in this particular SNP is what's different. But a feature of the, of the genome is that it is, it is very autocorrelated, right? And so by having genome-wide uh, samples, uh, having uh, you know, something on the order of about a, a, a million locations of the, the three billion on our genome, that you can, you can say that there's something uh, causal in this area. Does that make sense? Right? Um, and uh, uh, one can uh, repeat that with some confidence. So like, for example, the early version of this that uh, they did with only 100,000 people only had three sites. Um, all of those sites replicated in the new people that they got for this. Yeah. Yeah, so people are confident. Early on with GWAS, there was also this concern whether that would have a replicability issue, but people are much more confident. 
uh, about it now. Um, so from this, we can construct polygenic scores. And a polygenic score um, is going to be something where there's different ways to do it. The way that uh, the example I'm going to use here is, is to use, uh, first of all, it's entirely out of sample. So we're using the results of the genome-wide association that we showed. The respondents in the study that I'm going to be looking at are not involved in this at all. They are not the same people. So it's entirely out of sample, right? Um, uh, it also, the way that, that uh, ancestry is going to be addressed here, I'll talk about this uh, briefly a little bit more, is going to be uh, to have a score that's net of uh, the first 20 principal components for ancestry. Um, and then, uh, and this is the one that is, there's more alternate ways of doing it. Um, uh, so, so what we know here from a plot like this, the way that would be erroneous to think about this plot is to imagine, okay, well there are only, there are 74 locations on the genome and that's, that's what, those are the 74 loci, right? Um, because what they're expecting when they get a million, for example, is the same as the number of three went to 74, expecting the number 74 to go to some number higher than 74. If we knew which SNPs they were, we wouldn't have to do the data collection. Um, so in other words, we know some SNPs down here are also going to, are also genuinely causal, right? Uh, we don't know exactly which they are. We're not willing to say that any one of them couldn't just be due to chance if we're using this, taking this threshold seriously, but we are willing to aggregate them together into a score. Right? Yeah? And these are all uh, one at a time tests, conceptually. Yeah. Right? They, you yeah. don't know anything about gene yeah. interactions here. Yeah, so right, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they, the tests, uh, they prune for highly autocorrelated. There's, that's a whole area of things. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the idea of, they're simple additive models. Right? Yeah. And so there's not, there's not an interaction. Isn't it thought that a lot of these things are interact? So one gene turning on another and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there is, although, um, there's also a group, I mean, this is going to be a, one of the <coughs> questions going forward, uh, that is thinking that those effects uh, are not as large as one might think in terms of the total effect, or at least not something that is is uh, masking differences here. And the example that they would use um, is how successful they've been able to be with height in terms of recovering uh, heritability estimates. They're not there yet, but they feel like height has a very large number of additive uh, effects apparently. Now, whether that's the prototype for these other things is going to be remain to be. Uh, seen, but that was a big question when height started to get off the ground. Is there just going to be a bunch of gene, gene interactions and you're not going to get to that high of a threshold? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but height seems to be doing pretty well in that respect. And people, height's a good prototype outcome for that. Yeah. So it's constructed from uh, all of the variants. Right? Uh, and so the idea would be that, <coughs> that these are going to have uh, they're going to have lower S, so they're not going to figure much into the score. Um, uh, it ends up being, in the, in the data that I'm using, we have uh, 710,000 uh, variants. We're using data from the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. We have, uh, our, our chip has 710,000, about 100,000 of those end up going into the score, possibly to a very small extent, but... but there's technical details there, but that's it's a lot of information, in other words, about genetic variation. Um, so the data that, that we're using, it took us a long time to get the GWAS data, but now it's here and we're just we're getting our in, into uh, using it. It was kind of good it was delayed because this field kind of clarified itself while we were waiting for our data and doing other things. Um, uh, but if you, so uh, a, a, a diminishing reference is, uh, in terms of people following it, is a TV show, Happy Days, once upon a time, this was a big deal. It was the number one show on television for three years in the 1970s. Happy Days took place, fun fact, took place at a uh, 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 fictitious uh, Jefferson High in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, and centered on uh, Richie Cunningham, remember? Popsy Weber, Ralph Mel. They were all, in the timeline of the show, graduates from 1957 high school in the state of Wisconsin, which 
is what the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, by great coincidence, is based on. So the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study is a sample that was originally drawn as a one-third sample. Every Wisconsin high school senior was uh, uh, given a questionnaire, and one-third of those people were randomly sampled, and that's the base sample of the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. So you can think about this as, as Ralph or Potsy or Richie would each, in expectation, we'd have one of them in the WS. So we have Richie in the WS. We would not have the Fonz because he uh, was older by a couple of years and was not a high school graduate, although he did his GED in season three. Now, we can look at the Wisconsin data. The Wisconsin data are uh, overwhelmingly uh, white. Um, and they're overwhelmingly white because of the combination of the high school graduation, the population of Wisconsin at the time, and the early retention of longitudinal studies. The Wisconsin longitudinal study is so white that we can't, in the public release, identify who the non-white people are because of identifiability issues. Um, uh, but uh, with principal components, or with the, the genome-wide scores, there's a lot of reason why you, you don't want to mix different broad ancestral groups. Uh, in it. Um, and we can see that when you look at the principal components, don't look at the vertical variation, that's just to give you some space in it, but we can take the distance from the center of the Wisconsin sample, right? Um, and we can look at respondents uh, by their self-identified or identified race ethnicity of their parents. Uh, and we can see here, I don't know if the colors come out that great, but you can see that, or you can see that the African American and Asian respondents uh, uh, all are, are on the side of the most uh, difference. Uh, they, they essentially pop out of the principal components, which would suggest that you don't want to be uh, including them in the analysis. And we have purple and Native American uh, respondents as well. Incidentally, with the Native American respondents, this is a bit of an aside, but an, an intriguing one. Uh, with Native American respondents in surveys, self-identified Native American has become a topic of, of interest even controversy because there's certainly a subset of survey respondents who either genuinely believe they have Native American uh, as kind of a familial urban legend uh, that they have Native American uh, ancestry uh, or who simply gravitate to that to some making some statement about that they're Americans uh, by selecting uh, Native American uh, on a survey. Um, so we can ask ourselves, and so we can identify, this, this looks a little bit different because I exclude the, I use only respondents for which I have a sibling pair, and I exclude the African American or Asian respondents, but otherwise it's the same metric. So we can look at these respondents who say in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, they report Native American ancestry. We have siblings in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, so by pairing up siblings we can say, well, what about a sibling? Does their sibling agree that they have Native American ancestry? These are full siblings. We can tell genetically that they're full siblings. We can tell even if they did not tell us they were full siblings. That's something else. We don't know what to deal with that. We're not going to broach that with our respondents. But, um, and if we look, so we keep in blue if the sibling agrees, we can see that if the sibling agrees, all these cases over here, so, but we can see that a lot of these people for whom the sibling disagrees, right? You see this? Concentration of the blue points to the right of the graph. A lot of these people uh, over here, they're not any different from the respondents who have no uh, Native American ancestry uh, whatsoever. Right? So evidence of these two groups. For that matter, in our Wisconsin data, this is a famous graph of Europe, um, where you can see, uh, you can basically, if you look at the first two principal components um, and where people came from in Europe, this graph is from maybe 2008. It's early sort of. Uh, but I've probably seen at least at least 20 presentations that have put this slide up. Um, uh, that uh, you can see the sort of map of people's ancestry in their genome-wide data. Now, in Wisconsin, everybody's in Wisconsin, but they came from somewhere. Uh, they have immigrants, and we asked them where their mother and father uh, came from. Uh, and so we can look here, kind of made it, so at least through British, uh, Scandinavian, German, and Polish are the four uh, biggest groups in the data. You can see, even in here, if we look at uh, the principal component, you can see this nice west to east uh, in terms. These are people whose parents say that both say the same answer, uh, say British or Irish, Scandinavian, German, or Polish. You can see in the data, right? So this ancestral information um, is one thing to kind of read about it in the abstract. It's the other who have been working with the data set for a while and then get this and then see that it works, right? Okay, so with the, the genome-wide score, 
Right? So we can construct this score for educational attainment. Now we can construct scores from other things, BMI, cardiovascular disease, whatever. Uh, educational attainment has almost kind of a New York, New York angle for it, because like, this stuff works for educational attainment. If we think these other things, then if we can make it there, they can make it in a lot of other places. Um, that's not quite the lyric, but you know what I mean. Right? Um, so we can divide these into decimals, right? And we can look at educational transitions. We can look at whether they transition beyond high school. We can look at whether they completed college, right? Uh, and what we see in our data, this is just a Wisconsin graduate uh, respondents. We can see that we have uh, this difference, a difference from about 30% to about 60% over the course of the decimal. So in other words, not a statistically significant effect. I can put three stars by what, what, what is the line showing us? The line is showing the proportion. Right, so in other words, 30% of respondents in the lowest decile had uh, went to school beyond high school in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. Um, whereas, so this is their, their polygenic score, this is their, their polygenic information, whereas about 60% of the people in the highest decile. Right? Um, so the educational attainment is obviously their their report was a polygenic score is this information they don't know that we've taken from their genome, right? They were able to construct their genome. Again, entirely different sample providing this information as well, right? Now, uh, another fun fact about happy days that becomes relevant is if you remember, Richie also had a sister, uh, Joni. Joni was incidentally married. Uh, Chachi on the show was played by Scott Mayo, who recently played a big role in our presidential politics. Um, but uh, Joni and Chachi, or and Richie, were siblings. And in the WLS, we impaneled a randomly selected sibling from sample. So if we did select Richie into the sample, Joni would also be selected into the sample, and we would have uh, full siblings. Now, full siblings really start to make genetic data interesting to social scientists because, uh, in effect, they provide a kind of a natural experiment uh, for one another, right? I mean, the differences, the genetic differences between you and your, your full sibling, right, is random. And as we, as we know, we're... Uh, uh, enamored of things that are exogenous, the genetic variation is not changing over the course of people's lifetimes, and uh, has this natural experiment element that all of us with siblings have. In other words, you know, people search to Manitoba and elsewhere to find natural experiments, but really all of us with a sibling have a natural experiment and a big bit of randomness right there, right? Um, so we can compute, for example, we can compute the polygenic score for the respondent and for uh, their sibling we can see that it's correlated at about 0.53 between the respondent and, uh, uh, between the two respondents. Is that good? So to, to make this, I could probably do this differently for this audience, but I present for a variety of different things. So one way, this is just a uh, within-between model uh, for talking about uh, uh, the effect of, of uh, in this case, the effect of the score on years of education. Right? Um, so we have the we have the effect of using what I mean by a, a within between model is I'm going to decompose I'm going to have uh, for each pair right I'm going to have the average of the pairs that's going to be the between pair relationship and then I'm going to have the difference from that average for each individual that's the within pair relationship and the reason that I think it's illustrative here uh, is that uh, we could think well if this if these variants were really just picking up ancestral differences uh, of some kind, some kind of population stratification, but weren't really causal, we would see this between pair effect, but we wouldn't see it within pair effect. Right? Whereas otherwise, if there's something really causal going on, we would expect these to be more or less the same size. Right? We expect these to be more or less the same size. Right? And so we estimate, and we estimate this using a random effect. Right? Um, so we can see here this coefficient for the between pair for years of education. The question is whether this is going to be close to that or far from that. Right? And we see low, it is uh, virtually the same. Right? It's virtually the same. Uh, I, I didn't know when I was at this point if that was what's going to We we had that moment of trepidation because it's taken. Is this going to work to press? Uh, and, and wow, um, it is uh, more or less uh, the same. Right. Um, now, one of the things that uh, was shown, even with the, the first polygenic work on educational attainment, was, was in Sweden, the, the Swedish Twitter registry had a dramatic example of this, where the score that they had predicted, predicted educational attainment, but it predicted cognitive test scores uh, more or less uh, close to as well. 
And uh, at the time that this was coming out, cognitive uh, test scores, uh, the idea of trying to do that was, was mired, in all, as mired in an enormous number of false positives. It's much harder to study cognitive uh, tests from a GWAS perspective, although it's increasingly being done, uh, just because it's much easier to collect educational attainment than cognitive uh, information <coughs> uh, on respondents. But there is this suggestive information in the Wisconsin data. We have from 1957, everyone in their freshman and, and junior years uh, at that time uh, took a test uh, called the Hedden and Nelson Test of Mental Ability. Uh, that uh, exists in the data out of uh, administrative records uh, in the Wisconsin data. So we're going to look at this ourselves in the Wisconsin data. Right? And so we can do the same sort of in-between model here. Right? Uh, we have the coefficient for the adolescent test score here. Right? And so down or not. Uh, and we can see uh, that, again, it's about the same. Right? It's not the case. One might ask, well, is then is the reason that uh, genetic differences are related to educational uh, attainment differences, is that uh, explained by cognitive ability, right? So if we know, uh, in other words, it could just be the case that when we're studying uh, genetic differences in cognitive and educational attainment, we're really studying just what those tests capture. Right? Uh, that's a possible world. Uh, in fact, in our data, this is consistent with other studies. Uh, it explains about half the difference. It certainly does not explain all of the difference. Yeah? Minor question. Can you remind us who's in the WLS? It's not a single graduation year. It's several years of graduation? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's one graduation year, and then it's their sibling, whenever the sibling right. And their sibling. Yeah, so we were able to match. Okay, yeah, yeah, as long as a sibling graduated from Wisconsin high school. At some point. Uh, yeah, unless they were freakishly younger siblings, like really big younger siblings, and they, they, they didn't do the test and right, they right. moved around a lot. But we more or less have it. Um, okay. Now, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was a hand, it was camera manipulation. So uh, a finding that's gotten a lot of attention in the last year, some controversy uh, associated, it was, is connected to this paper. And obviously it has a provocative title, The Genetics of uh, Success. Um, and it shows that that uh, educational score that I showed um, is associated with uh, a whole lot of things other than uh, educational attainment that we would regard as uh, successful life outcomes. I'm not looking at exactly the same outcomes here, but just to kind of give you a flavor in terms of how we can think about it. These are between within results for some different things, like, for example, uh, occupational uh, uh, prestige, sort of Duncan SEI. Uh, the value of people's homes that they report living in in midlife. So these are all midlife uh, self-reported health uh, in uh, midlife, and uh, whether or not they uh, left or lived in Wisconsin or not uh, in uh, midlife. And we can see all of those. The, edu the, the educational score uh, is associated with all of those outcomes. So in other words, people with higher uh, educational attainment scores, they have more prestigious jobs, they live in more expensive homes, they have better health, and uh, maybe they don't live in Wisconsin as a tendency, right? The uh, vertical scales are normed somehow? Yeah. And in what you said earlier? Pleading, which part? Are you just talking about the vertical axis? Yeah. Yeah, they're different metrics. Um, I mean, but also in natural units, or are those Measured in standard deviations. Or uh, this, this, for example, is SI, SEI units. So this is saying this is log dollars. This is uh, four point scale of health, and this is the probability. Okay. That, so you get a sense of the size. So in other words, the instance that they find two thirds the way up the graph. Well, <laughs> not the <laughs> uh, I had one of something that, that uh, presented uh, looked looked all right. I mean, the key thing is that they they don't go down here. But the other, the key thing that is the key key thing uh, is you'll notice here that I'm going to add uh, educational attainment to the model and show you the within effect there. So the question I'm asking right, is, is it the case that, so you could imagine this somehow, this educational score being some kind of genetic monster truck thing that just kind of rolls over and shows itself in all kinds of different uh, guises or like a, I guess a zealot-like figure. Um, or one can imagine that these later outcomes are probably largely, more or less, reflected in the educational attainment difference, right? Uh, mediated by it. They didn't really have in this genetic success, they didn't really have the data to look at this properly, but we can look at this within families, right? 
uh, and we can just put educational attainment in it. And you can see that what happens when we do is that those effects largely go away. So uh, the genetics of success in that sense is really uh, the wide benefits of educational attainment uh, if educational attainment is uh, indeed uh, the mediating scenario. But you could yeah. reverse the role if you instead of doing educational attainment in occupation, then right, then you add occupation to the model. And yeah, yeah. I mean, the difference would be the difference would be they got their education came first, right? right? Um, but uh, for some of these things, uh, one would wonder about exactly that. Right? Yeah. We wonder about exactly that. And for that matter, you can. There's other the mediating scenario is not the only scenario. Right. Um, it's it's perhaps the Occam's razor scenario, but it's not the only scenario. So we have what five more? Okay. Minutes? What would you like me to do? What do I have next? <laughs> <laughs> I got this, and I talk. I can just talk about what I generally. Uh, I mean, I generally think that that social scientists need to be thinking more about sort of mutualistic nature of many of its constructs, and that especially the idea that the what happens over the life course is you see a lot of mutualisms uh, coming into alignment. Um, uh, uh, some sort of complex sort of things uh, uh, moving across different levels of analysis, um, and to me, it makes things less scary than some of that stuff that people imagine is going on. Um, but that is also something for which I think this is obviously going to be uh, a very complicated slot. We recognize uh, this in terms of getting it. If we really want to get at what's going on as opposed to just estimating the effects of policy interventions, uh, I think uh, that's going to be uh, very difficult. And I think genomic data, uh, given this fact that it's so extensive, the information that's in the genome, uh, that it doesn't change over the life course. And that once we have siblings, we have the source of variation that we can uh, exploit from children uh, raised together, I think it's going to be a very promising uh, tool. I, I, my previous version of the, the last talk I gave it at Berkeley, I think, was about, ah, oh, this stuff does not work with candidate genes, and, uh, and uh, open to the possibility with this, but these polygenic scores, as far as I can tell, really do work. Uh, so that's what I have. Oh, uh, well, let's do it in Canada and Claude. So be a nice contrast, or the other way around. <laughs> well, I wanted to come back to the last plots. When sure. I'm understanding you're putting in the actual educational attainment in mm -hmm. the occupation home value of the score. So yeah. Now, we know, and, and you're... I'd like you to spell out a little more why you feel that that supports a mediated by educational attainment story. Because we know that the score and educational attainment are correlated, and we know that the score and these other outcomes are correlated. Sure. So naturally, uh, there's a kind of automatic erosion of the coefficient with these kinds of, if you had enormous samples, mm -hmm. you could tell the angles between them. Sure. But you're going to have to uh, drive these down, and it doesn't look as if they're being driven down hugely more than the uh, error bar. They're being driven down, mm -hmm. but wouldn't they have to be driven down? Sure. Whether or not uh, your, the EA score was sure. really picking up some yeah. general biological capacity. Yeah, so I I would be I would be more while I'm not I'm not gainsaying that scenario entirely, I would I would regard that as my my, my likelihood of that in my mind would go up if not for the the highly discrete nature of educational attainment. So in other words in the sample uh, I can't remember the exact number but something on the order of half the people had the same value of twelve. Um, and then you start to have the few values of 13, 14, and clumping on 16, and only nine possible values uh, for the graduates. There are a few uh, siblings who didn't graduate. So in other words, there's a lot of variation left over um, once you take out that, right? Um, it would be interesting to imagine different kinds of maybe bidding up and just kind of to just kind of explore that possibility. You could imagine somebody just taking the head spin. 
binning it and looking at what that does, or imperfectly binning it. So that's a good idea. Um, but that's the reason. If it were something where it was a fully, qu fully quantitative measure uh, with a lot of variation on, in, in terms of the <coughs> more, the plausibility of that would be higher for uh, Claude Mendes. <coughs> So uh, I have one pure question, one sort of theoretical question. Uh, the, the scores are generated uh, as sort of abstractly, empirically. Uh, uh, that is, any mechanism between any one SNP and, and the outcome is punted on, right? Yeah. And it's it's hypothesis free is a phrase I'll use. <laughs> okay. You kind of have to get your head around how that is a good thing. Uh, to be around, right. yeah. and, and, and of course, and of course, you know, just as a side comment, of course, it, it speaks a lot to the, the you know fifty year debate about this stuff. Because yeah. if, for example, one of those SNPs affects the sensitivity of uh, your eardrum, mm -hmm. which in turn affects the extent to which you pick up information in schools, so that's a very different model. Sure. And the SNP has to do with the speed of uh, the neuron, the synapse yeah. of the neuron. So, yeah. Okay. So at this stage, it's all just we don't know what the, the, these these things do, but we know that the statistics. Yeah, but it's clear it's very diffuse. Huh? It's clear that it's extremely diffuse. Okay. I mean, it, it's not it's not one thing. Okay. Then we, it, it, so maybe my second thing, conceptual, is actually connected to that, which is so the the issue of diverging. We need to some other title. So I'm, I'm thinking of this work that I guess was Flynn and Deacon. So yeah, the they, Flynn Deacon's model. Huh? The Flynn Dickens model. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which basically says you, 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 because of, of selection into settings, into environments, you can start off with almost very unimportant difference between yeah. A and B and it gets multiplied over time. Yeah. It seems to me that, that, that this kind of work would be consistent with that, yes. that model. Yes. Uh, we don't find any big, uh, there's, there's no gene for G uh, or anything like that. Uh, yeah. But there's all these possible things that could just sort of set the path dependency off just by a little bit, right. given the the uh, recur uh, reinforcing mechanisms we get yeah. in later life. We get the, the yeah, emergence. yeah. I mean, especially I mean that's right. And I I find I find that general way of thinking inspirational, and and a kind of a larger theme would be sort of wishing wishing people who studied health looked at what was going on in cognition more, and wishing people who studied cognition looked at health more, um, in terms of how uh, ways of thinking, but, it, but uh, particularly with this, because, um, I mean, if one starts to take seriously and think about cognitive selectivity over the life course, we imagine that all kinds of every, uh, every part of the environment is, is potentially shaped by that. Uh, especially insofar as it influences choice, and especially as, as children get more agency over the outcome. So that's, uh, I think, becoming the leading scenario uh, for why people think of the, the increase over age, uh, for example. Um, uh, even hardcore people have come around uh, to that uh, that view that that's at least some important mechanism because we see this 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 selection, and so one can imagine ways that uh, if you have that selection, different the environment and the, the person are coming. The environment is making the person and the person is coming to fit the environment at the same time. And so initial differences can expand to things. We see this in reading, right? So small differences in reading ability is a famous example from Jenks. But small differences in reading ability we know are connected to, uh, to children reading more, right? Uh, gaining identity as a reader, gaining more from reading, which is part of the reason uh, to read more. And then as a result, you see an expansion of, of reading ability, right? In the same way that that, but this, this we take as striking in a way that if we think about like that you could have a, have a tall kid or a moderately athletic kid uh, getting uh, attention uh, and as a result of that uh, being a better free throw shooter later than the other, you know, gaps in that kind of physicality are running up. It's a similar kind of thing in the development of talents in the, in the non-development of non-talents. Yeah. Daniel? My question is fraught and not well thought out. So okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, I think in, in these models, you're saying um, there's this association between this po polygenic score and these various later life outcomes, and they're partially mediated by education. Could yeah. we take the polygenic score as the mediator between a family background variable and these later life outcomes? Yes, in fact, right. that's the case. Use race, and maybe we're not to, but well, parental yeah. occupational attainment, parental education, parental wealth, and 
child's home value? Is that measured at WMS? Is that a doable thing? Yeah, no, so that's that's a slide I skipped in fact. So that's that's a question because so so the question that one could ask is uh, for people interested in family background and outcomes, always lurking in the background, sometimes we call it things like unobserved heterogeneity, euphemisms like that, right? But uh, when people are talking about that, a lot of what they imagine themselves to be talking to at, at least is, is genes, right? And so is this all uh, uh, really just a genetic difference propagating itself over the generation? We can get exactly that. Um, what we can't uh, get uh, as much leverage on the thing. So the thing that that would be a hero thing to present to, to a sociology audience <laughs> would be to just control the <laughs> score. Because uh, if you just put the score in, the score doesn't. Ex it's it's just a predictive score. It doesn't. It's not intended to be all of the variance. Right. Right. So the score doesn't really change the coefficient that much. Oh, okay. Right. A family background. But the, so then you have to start to think. Well, what do we think is the relationship of that score to the true underlying thing? And we do have we do have different leverage on that, um, and so this would be showing the what we would expect the family background uh, attenuation to be uh, from no attenuation to complete attenuation, uh, given uh, imagining uh, more variance in the error. Uh, this is a simple error in variables uh, thing, which has other assumptions. But but from this, it's really a glass half empty, glass half full thing, where you can imagine that about half the effect could be attenuated or half isn't. And it makes a big difference what assumptions you make about the error. I probably think that it's going to be somewhere in here, which would suggest that there's family background real, uh, but uh, maybe 30, 40 percent of it is is uh, explained by underlying genetic things. Most of this, however, most of this is already accounted for if the data set has a cognitive ability measure. So most of this attenuation is is already reflected in the information and cognitive. One last question. For okay. You. Well, uh, you started with uh, reporting earlier estimates of what, 40% heritability of educational yeah. attainment or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so, uh, you, uh, you really didn't mention, or you, at least you didn't emphasize, what this work would yeah, so suggest. Yeah, so in our, well, so the score, just if you just take the score and do it R squared, is for us, I think uh, it is just shy of 4%. Um, other people have observed, um, have said 6%, there's one data set that's saying 10%. I don't think that that, for this score, it's possible the approved score is going to get uh, up to 10% in more data. Um, so that's about what we have. So that's kind of where you start to think. So if you think that you could just take 4 and divide it by 40, then that would kind of put you in a 1, one in 9 scenario. So yeah. That's why I had it centered here. And you see, yet some of what you showed if I was reading the chart correctly, back in the uh, Wisconsin data, it looked like approximately doubling the probabilities of things like uh, graduation. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's not yeah, inconsistent. Yeah. It's just a no. I you it's know, just I wondered about exactly but that. strong effect. I've person. actually wondered about exactly that, um, and I don't have a good answer for it. There is well, what, so one thing that is a uh, well, it doesn't really speak to your issue, but I'm just going to bring it up. Anyway. So maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, is uh, an emerging idea in this field, uh, and there's some evidence for it, is that, uh, that the polygenic scores, the scores that become significant in, uh, in this kind of, because you have to put together all these different samples, that the scores that are going to become significant are going to reflect the variants that are least sensitive to environmental uh, uh, contingencies. Uh, for what you said, it'd be the same thing for in a gene by gene interaction, yeah. for that matter. Um, and so, uh, that I mean, that has implications. So, in other words, the the genetic signal that you get out of the score as it exists now is going to reflect that part of heritability that is least environmentally sensitive. Um, I don't know if that's going to have bearing on something like the the magnitude of the effect that I observed, but so I can just leave as a last question saying, yeah, that's a good point. I've wondered about that too. And I haven't done the I haven't done the work of trying to imagine what we would expect the attendant effect to look like on a different error scenario than that. But your question promised me that I need to do that. Thank you very much.